Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you on the third panel of the conference Interculture and Interfaith Dialogue, this year entitled Enriching Future Communities. My name is Nikola Strachová and I'm currently based at the Institute of International Relations, Prague, as head of Czech Network of Annalen Foundation. And I'm delighted to chair this panel today. This panel focuses on multilateral youth networks and our future communities and brings together five very interesting and distinguished speakers from various backgrounds. However, what they do have in common for sure is uh, the interest in mutual understanding and the global dialogue. This panel also aims to answer some crucial questions uh, of this very specific period of time. Some of uh, these questions are, can the situation we are experiencing uh, help to create a new kind of solidarity? What's the role of civil society and organization in this respect and how we can contribute to building better connectivity among cultures uh, and communities? We will try to tackle these issues uh, from different perspectives, incorporating some specific and practical examples. And I'm persuaded that uh, we will have a remarkable discussion. And it's my great honor to uh, welcome here uh, Her Excellency Elizabeth Gigu, uh, President of Annalen Foundation, uh, as former Minister of European Affairs of France, member of the European Parliament and chair of the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee of French National Assembly. She has high level experience of the international and Euro-Mediterranean cooperation. Uh, in addition to this, uh, President Gigou was uh, the first female to be appointed uh, Minister of Justice in France. Then I would uh, like to welcome here uh, Dr. Dodik Arianto. Uh, Dr. Arianto joined the General Secretariat of uh, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation in June 2014 uh, as a head of Cultural Affairs Department. Uh, currently, he is the head of the OIC Islamophobia Observatory Center, which monitors uh, Islamophobia trend around the world. Since 2016, Dr. Arianto also bears responsibility uh, as the OIC focal point to the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. I would like to also welcome among our speakers, uh, Ms. Zinab Abdel Fattah Zidane who is a university lecturer of English literature, ambassador of Erasmus Plus virtual exchange program, and also debate trainer and facilitator at Young Mediterranean Voices, a project founded by the Annalyn Foundation, where she leads different intercultural dialogue, debates, uh, session and training on global challenges and uh, your Mediterranean region. Then we have here Mr. Viet Dofam. Mr. Dofam is a lawyer and entrepreneur born in uh, Vietnam and living in the Czech Republic from his six years old. Uh, he's one of the founders of the, of the Association of Young uh, Vietnamese Entrepreneurs and uh, participated in establishing the, the VietApp organization and Czech Viet Educational Institution, bearing in mind the need for a more inclusive society, uh, the Association of Young Vietnamese Entrepreneurs uh, served besides all as a platform to support uh, the understanding among uh, different cultures. And last but not least, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Jakub Muczka. Uh, Mr. Muczka is a doctoral candidate in philosophy at the Faculty of Arts at the Charles University. Uh, he is specialized in um, Christian philosophy, particularly in uh, Russian tradition. He focuses mainly on uh, um, Christian social and political teaching uh, and connecting theory with practice with his studies resulted uh, in the foundation of uh, Atlas of uh, Today's World, the non-profit uh, project which aims to provide to the general public systematic expert reflection on the current political and social situation uh, in the world. Uh, before we start the panel discussion, I would like to mention, especially for the newcomers, that you could add your comments or questions uh, under the stream into the chat. I will kindly ask all, this, all speakers to deliver their remarks in roughly 15 minutes time limit. So we have at least few minutes in the end to answer questions from the audience. So without further ado, I would like to give a floor to our first panelist, uh, Her Excellency President Gigu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicola. I'm very pleased to see you again and congratulations for 
organizing this very important meeting and uh, good afternoon to ladies and gentlemen to all of you i'm very happy to be uh, with you uh, for a few moments uh, on this very important uh, subject how can we revive intercultural dialogue which includes uh, religious dialogue of course um, and and make it live uh, despite the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, as you probably know, the uh, ALA um, Annaline Foundation is a um, multinational uh, foundation with uh, gathering uh, 42 countries uh, and uh, uh, 42 uh, national networks, among which <laughs> you, the network that you uh, you, you had, uh, Nicola, is one of uh, the very good ones. Uh, so 40, 42 net, networks in 42 different countries, which amount to uh, more than 4,500 uh, NGOs. We are certainly the largest uh, um, network uh, in the Euro-Mediterranean uh, area. And we focus on uh, educating youth uh, from 18 to 35 uh, to cultural dialogue. Why uh, is, uh, is it necessary? Because, um, uh, and it is, it is for this dialogue that the ALF was created in 2005 to counter the idea the very, very nocive idea of clash of civilizations. You're too young, most of you, to remember this expression, but uh, uh, we believe with a lot of, you know, scholars uh, in the North and South Mediterranean that there is no clash of civilization. If there is a clash, it can only be a clash of ignorance. And therefore, the Annaline Foundation was created to uh, promote dialogue between youth of both uh, uh, shores, to um, educate youth to mutual understanding, to mutual respect, of course, of their diversity, but also to find what you need uh, all uh, the people around uh, the Mediterranean. And uh, uh, of course, we have developed um, since uh, uh, our creation 15 years ago, um, we have developed a, a number of programs and among which uh, Young Mediterranean Voices as quoted, and uh, a number of programs and of initiatives that, uh, that enable and gives the capability to young men and women. And we are very keen in having uh, a lot of young women in our programs uh, to, uh, um, to be educated to uh, uh, cultural dialogue. What does it mean? Well, first to... Um, uh, fight prejudice, misunderstanding, stereotypes, and also to, uh, uh, to, to, to be uh, active citizens in their country, uh, which means that uh, we feel that uh, youth has to be, has to know uh, their uh, environment, their institutional environment, they have to participate in the debates in their town, in their uh, countries. And they have, of course, uh, to be uh, also able to use, uh, uh, to use the media in a proper way. Because as you know uh, very well, as much as I do, uh, what we receive from the media, both classical media and um, social networks, has to be uh, interpreted. And sometimes uh, we receive fake news or we receive messages of hate. 
and violence. And this has, of course, uh, to, be, to be fought. And this is the mission of uh, the Amelian Foundation, to give tools, intellectual tools, um, practical tools to youth, to uh, be an active citizen, which is the best way to prepare for uh, uh, best training for work <laughs> and jobs, uh, to uh, also uh, be, an, uh, besides being an active citizen, to, uh, um, to be active in the, uh, in the media. And therefore, not only to, uh, uh, to, to, to see which are the, uh, uh, normal messages on the media, but also to uh, give uh, a different narrative, the narrative of mutual understanding and cultural dialogue. And so uh, we think that uh, with the COVID crisis and especially with its consequences, which are heavily worrying in all our countries, certainly in Europe, but maybe more, even more, in the South Mediterranean. With this crisis, which is a sanitary crisis, but also, and more and more, an economic and social crisis, we need to the cultural dialogue all the more than before. And we need it to fight not only uh, xenophobia, racism, distrust, and violence, but also uh, to fight inequalities, because a lot of uh, young children and, and, uh, and youngsters have been uh, deprived of access to education because of the lockdown. And, uh, and of course, the most fragile, the uh, uh, youth coming from a very modest uh, uh, social environment are the, the, the first to be victims of this situation. And, uh, and of course, we have to fight the uh, uh, protectionism, not only on the economic field, but because everyone is inclined to protect himself. And this is, of course, this is very damaging for uh, social uh, uh, links. And therefore, uh, in this uh, very special uh, situation, uh, we have developed programs that we, we were responsible for before, even before uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, for example, the webinars that we developed for our young Mediterranean voices, and maybe Zinab remembers that, <laughs> but it was three years ago that we were asked by the European Commission in, uh, on, inside the frame of the program Erasmus Plus uh, Virtual to develop those webinars. And when the COVID crisis came, we had the methodology, we had the know-how, and, and of course, our uh, young uh, uh, members uh, were used to, you, to use this, uh, this tool. So we developed that considerably. And what we are doing this afternoon is one of the best examples of that. We are chatting on the net. And it is a, a very, very uh, precious uh, way to keep the link despite the closure of borders. But I must, uh, uh, you must be aware that uh, although we will need to develop even further the uh, digital uh, tools and the digital ways of communication, uh, it cannot replace completely uh, meetings uh, with active and effective presence. Nothing can replace that. And therefore, in our uh, communities, I think that uh, all of us where we are we have to fight the uh, increasing tendency to closure, to um, lockdowns, even after uh, the COVID crisis. And we have to uh, continue to organize effective mobility 
between the two shores of the Mediterranean. Even before the crisis, this mobility was uh, not uh, um, what it should be for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but then it is a major uh, priority, I think, to say that uh, not only do we, uh, do we have to develop the digital links and digital mobility, but we need to fight and to be activists of uh, uh, an effective uh, mobility between, between the two shores. And this is what the last uh, message I wanted to uh, convey to you, because I think that only the civil society that you represent in your diversity can obtain that from our governments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your inspiring contribution, especially highlighting the need for a deeper cooperation and the activization of citizens, especially in terms of uh, media literacy, as we all see it as a crucial step to more inclusive society. So thank you very much. And now I would like to give a floor to uh, Dr. Arianto. Please, Dr. Arianto, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicola. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, distinguished co-panelists and uh, all participants. First of all, allow me to express my gratitude for being able to participate at this year intercultural and interfaith dialogue hosted by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic. And today, I am speaking uh, at this session on multilateral youth networks and future communities on behalf of the OIC General Secretary. When the organizer told me that I was uh, expected to deliver a presentation under the topic of youth networks and future communities, I was struggling hard to find the relevance with my area of work, uh, as well as my portfolios in the OIC, which uh, for your information, have less things to do with either youth issue, issues or community matters. But when I saw the outlines of the program, uh, I found some relevant clues, which is the impact or negative implications of COVID-19 pandemic especially those on the deepening inequalities and the rise of xenophobia, racism and distrust among the followers of different religions. Uh, therefore, I would rather focus on the specific impacts and leave uh, the detailed elaborations on youth and communities to other panelists. So from there, we can have discussions during the interactive session and later on, we may come up with a possible suggestion. Within this context, uh, the first question that came to my mind was, what has the COVID-19 exactly done to the existing relations among different elements within societies? Of which, actually, the answer has been made available by the organizers in the briefing outline for decision that COVID-19 has exposed not only the vulnerability and inequality in societies, but the pandemic has also brought new forms of discrimination. Worse still, during this critical time, distrust and tensions among religions were unfortunately also on the rise, creating uh, further division within societies. So at this presentation, I would just try to find the relevant evidence by uh, looking at what has been happening and bring them into your kind attention. The fact that COVID-19 has exacerbated social inequality and vulnerability is widely admitted and reported by many governments and world institutions. Uh, for instance, I just want to quote one of those reports saying that the most impacted people tend to be marginalized and excluded, depend heavily on the informal economy for earnings, occupy a race Areas of prone to shocks have inadequate access to social service, lack of social protections, are denied access to services on the basis of age, gender, race, ethnicity, religion, migrant status, etc. The condition which is much worse in war zones where health systems have often completely collapsed. 
vulnerability is also reflected through the rise of domestic violence due to the lockdown being applied by authorities to minimize the spread of the virus, especially women and girls who found themselves at higher risk of sexual and domestic violence. Admittedly, these unfortunate things had happened in many countries in all continents. There is uh, no secret that COVID-19 has also boosted xenophobia, hate mongering, scapegoating, discrimination and ethnocultural racism. Uh, as someone who is responsible for the Islamophobia Observatory in the YC General Secretariat, I'm quite confident in saying this. Since uh, we in the YC, we are monitoring the Islamophobia trend around the world uh, on daily basis, including uh, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, Christophobia, and any other forms of uh, discrimination and racism. What we can see from the situation since the outbreak of the pandemic, right wing group has used uh, COVID-19 to pursue their agenda of anti-immigrant. Not only that, they also pursue their agenda of white supremacist, ultranationalist, anti-Semitic, Islamophobia, and the similars. Uh, for instance, since the first case of COVID-19 was discovered in China, uh, then attacks against people of Asian origins had been reported soaring, followed by a significant rise in discriminatory behaviors against different ethnic groups and minorities around the world. Many countries have witnessed a spike in anti-immigrants, including anti-Muslim sentiments. Moreover, those with precarious citizenship status, such as migrant workers, refugees, and inter even international students, they have experienced additional level of discrimination during the pandemic. Uh, there have been reports worldwide about detention of migrant workers and refugees, blaming them for spreading the disease. And for refugees and uh, asylum seekers who were held in detentions or camps, the COVID-19 posed uh, even additional threat to their already vulnerable condition, as you could imagine. And then another impact that I'd like to highlight here is uh, the rise of uh, distrust and tensions among religions. Tension among religions has been on the rise here and there since ever. We know that. And from the Oasis lands, I could mention some examples. For instance, in Myanmar and Sri Lanka, uh, where there has been tensions between Muslim and Buddhist. In Central African Republic, there has been tensions between Christians and Muslims. In Palestine, there has been tensions between Jews and Muslims. And uh, during the recent times, we could find even more indicators. Uh, for instance, as the COVID-19 pandemic yields uh, devastating repercussions worldwide, anti-Muslim groups in some countries have tapped the crisis to fuel hatred towards Muslims. Social media is inundated with claims of Muslims breaching the lockdown by continuing to attend mosques to pray. Unfortunately, uh, some Islamophobic leaders have also used the coronavirus as a tool to further their agenda against Muslims. Um, in India, tensions now is um, mounting between Muslims and Hindus especially since the beginning of this year, when the case of COVID-19 were reported in a, in a, there is a public Jama'a event, because of which then hashtag Corona Jihad and Bio Jihad were trending on Twitter. Some distorted stories blaming Muslims for spreading the virus in the country started circulating on the social media, casting Muslims as a threat to the nation. Today, um, we may predict on visible tensions between Muslims and other religions across Europe as uh, of series of events and incidents in the continent following the renewed provocations and tragedies in France since early September. So um, all these things um, shows us that there are tensions among religions. As a response, um, facing such a delicate situation, what is required is res as response would certainly be complex and multidimensional. Uh, but I can tell you here uh, of something that we firmly believe in the OIC. 
what mostly needed at this critical time is solidarity and unity. By working together, uh, hand in hand, in accordance to our unique capacity. Therefore, during this COVID-19 pandemic, a dialogue, uh, we believe, must play its most importance. Why? Uh, because dialogue emphasizes on inclusion, empowerment, mutual respect, and interpersonal engagement, the elements which are mostly needed to generate intergroup solidarity, cross-cultural and cross-religion cooperations. And who is responsible for this noble task? Of course, all of us. Therefore, uh, efforts should be done through coll collective actions by governments, international organizations, non-government organizations, civil societies, religious leaders, private sectors, and so on. Uh, to close my presentation uh, on behalf of the institution that I'm representing, allow me to mention three facts which hopefully could serve as a food for thought and reflection. Uh, first, it has been almost a year now that the world is struggling against COVID-19. And until today, we still have less idea when this pandemic will completely over. Secondly, COVID-19 has brought about fundamental impact to almost every single aspect of our life. And third, COVID-19 is threatening the safety of all people, regardless their race, nation, culture, and religions. Therefore, uh, COVID-19 should have left us with a very important lesson that in order to survive on this planet, each of us need to cooperate that we must embrace each other regardless of our religious or cultural backgrounds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arianto, very much, uh, especially uh, for elaborating on the impacts uh, of uh, the pandemic, which we all see it around us. It's crystal clear that we uh, should have more than ever encourage uh, dialogue, which should not have been stopped uh, by the situation. And uh, we should uh, take a hate speech as one of the critical elements uh, of raising xenophobia. Although uh, COVID as a disease uh, treats us all equally. Uh, I would like to just quickly mention, quickly reiterate uh, that uh, you uh, can add your comments and questions to, into the chat uh, under the stream. And now I would like to uh, move to our next panelist, um, Ms. Dan, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me reiterate my thanks again uh, for the Annaline Foundation and the International Institute, uh, the um, yeah, the Institute of International Relations in Prague, and uh, uh, Miss Elizabeth Gagu and uh, all that great for all the great work in the conference. Um, let me just hit on, on uh, or extend what has been said uh, about um, the challenges that face youth, especially in the Euromed region during the pandemic and how, um, for example, like they were not exposed to um, uh, true information through the media or uh, how they learn, for example, to, to check the facts from news and so on. So in the light of COVID-19, it was one of the most common problems that faced uh, um, especially young people in the Euromid region was fighting disinformation and fake news, uh, which was all the time spreading hatred or intolerance uh, and exclusion of the others. Um, and in a world led like today, full of uncertainty where media uh, plays a pivotal role in shaping the public's perception and uh, with the advent of uh, globalization and digital media with 24 seven coverage, uh, it's important and crucial uh, to learn that um, in, in the sphere of media, how to gauge the quality and the diversity of these information. And I would speak about a country like Egypt in my country where it was plagued by misinformation and um, 
especially at the time of COVID. And it's very likely the gap between media and news was very, very broad. Uh, and according, let me just share a statistic according to the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Uh, in between uh, between uh, January and April, there were like a, a research uh, sample on on 69 pieces of misinformation produced by a fact-checking organization called uh, Dash or Don't Believe. 93% um, estimated false claims uh, about the virus itself and about the the claims. Uh, 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 sorry, and about the treatment, uh, where also 23% claims were about the, the government responses to the to the virus itself and to the to the treatment. Other other also false news went for, for example, sharing false videos or old videos uh, for for politicians. Uh, like Angela Merkel, for example, from 2013, uh, that claiming that Germany had found the vaccine and so on. Other also journalists went uh, went for um, conspiracy theory or claiming that the USA, for example, is responsible for spreading the virus. And I think the key reason behind that can can as can be attributed to two reasons. Which, which is the rise of populism and the lack of proper education, which would encourage citizen-to-citizen -citizen relationship and engage young people in the democratic process. And one way that we, uh, I've, I've just witnessed through the leadership programs for young people during the pandemic uh, was the, it was the, a, a very, very much effective approach uh, to challenge the, uh, these fake news and, and also to, to search behind these news was youth participation in non-formal education provided by civil society, such as leadership programs like the Young Mediterranean Voices and Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange, uh, which enhances intercultural debates and dialogue uh, about uh, uh, with people from both shores of the Mediterranean, aiming to address common concerns in their communities uh, and participate in decision making. And these programs also offer training in, in media literacy and fact checking, for example, policy drafting uh, and media reporting where young people learn how to to weigh down what kind of news to be credible or non-credible and most interestingly these programs also can act to train youth on how to to counter extremism uh, promoted by the mainstream media discourse and also to to, to amplify their voices and um uh, and I think also the objectives of these programs goes hand in hand with the Annalyn's uh, recent report in 2018, uh, when, when young people were asked about the measures to tackle extremism. Let, let me share some statistics from this report, where 43% from Europe to 64% from the southern and eastern Mediterranean region said that education and youth-led initiatives to foster intercultural dialogue are the, the effective methods or most effective methods to counter extremism. Uh, for exchange programs evolving across the Mediterranean, there were 39% uh, from Europe to 54% from the southern and eastern Mediterranean claimed that this is one of the greatest solutions. For interreligious dialogue, 30% 30, uh, 30 from Europe to 53% from uh, southern and eastern Mediterranean. As for support, uh, supporting youth participation in public life, uh, we have 39% uh, from Europe to 62% from southern and eastern Mediterranean. Uh, Mediterranean and cross-cultural reporting, uh, we have like 28% from Europe to 53% from southern eastern Mediterranean. And finally, for training in diversity management and radicalization prevention, we have 28% from Europe to 50% uh, from southern eastern Mediterranean uh, went to, uh, in, the, in favor of these programs. We must not also forget that these programs uh, are, face, uh, are focusing on the current issues and situations that been that has been going on uh, on on the community of these youths for example it tackles like um, problems like migration or refugees it, it all the time educates young people uh, with with uh, cases like why migrants for example are staying in our country uh, how they, do they contribute to the economy or why on the contrary impact the economy or uh, <clears throat> uh, causes like uh, some kind of crisis in, in the country and so on, and how and what are the possible solutions to deal with these crises. For example, we tackled issues of refugees because it, it, it was not common on, 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 the, on the basis of young people in Egypt to understand what are the status of refugees, for example, in Egypt and why, why are, are they fleeing their countries and how, how their status or residence in Egypt, whether it's permanent or, or for example, um, 
uh, temporary and so on. So all of these methods of education would help young people to get over extremism and also at the same time to 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 check the speeches of politicians who tend to uh, falsify numbers, for example, or to exaggerate from crisis to, to spread xenophobia or victimization and so on. And also to teach them how to produce counter narratives in, 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 in to not, not at the same time uh, trading hatred with hatred as journalism in Egypt is, is, uh, is so uh, widespread doing that all the time. And I will give an example later on on my speech. Um, where when uh, being like an academic or in teaching at the university where like um, young students wanted to get engaged in such pro programs where um, I'm also representing uh, Erasmus virtual exchange I'm an ambassador and also a trainer in that program so I suggested because this program like offers many um, multinational uh, uh, spaces for people from both shores of the Mediterranean to come in a virtual platform to discuss common issues like hate speech, peace building, for example, and, and like come together on a common ground of mutual um, uh, mutual challenges and how together can 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 find solutions for these. So um, young people in the department, they study English literature and they study when Madame Gugu mentioned clash of civilization. I remember very much they were studying Edward Said and the orientalization and how, for example, um, the representation of the other should be changed. And they wanted to implement all these critical theories into something real life advocacy. So I suggested that they should uh, join for, for the, at first an intercultural debate. It was about gender mainstreaming. And when they returned back, they, they showed an interest of, of engaging in more. So they were engaged in a course of uh, countering hate speech. I myself was part of that course. And we have built an, a smaller club or an initiative between us like with 10 students and me, it, we called it like Friends of Peace. And in that initiative, we discussed, uh, we learned how to, to debate and to build intercultural dialogue, how to, to, to campaign, to, to build campaigns for the media, how to address media platforms, for example. And during that time, uh, it was the project of finishing the course. And we built a campaign, I remember, about a current issue on media, it was rising tension and hate speech against Egyptian expats in the Gulf, the migrant workers. And, and during that time, there were rising uh, hatred tension through social media, calling for deportations of Egyptian migrant workers from Kuwait under many pretexts of um, uh, exploiting and uh, consuming uh, infrastructures and so on. So uh, what happened is that all Egyptian journalists and, and what, what you can see in TV is also trading hatred with another hatred. Journalists were all the time also showing uh, counter hatred, which at the end will be in a vicious circle of endless hatred and stigmatization. For us, like we were trained uh, by the end to build uh, that campaign of, count of, of how to produce counter narrative. I remember that we've, we've done a lot of research about the problem and how to deal with it. And they, they come up like with a campaign called Stop Nationalistic Hatred. They, they defined how migrant workers are living in Kuwait, how they are legally residing there and so on. So at the end, they corrected the misconceptions being promoted at the, at the media. And at, uh, at the same time, also, they, they produced a counter narrative devoid of any stigmatization and hatred at the same time. So to come up with these experiences that I have lived through with these two programs um, in, in, in two years, uh, that leadership programs in, in a country like mine is very, very essential. And in, in, in investing in these programs, would would like in, enhance young people's capability to address policy makers and, and media organizations, especially in countries and communities like mine, where where uh, institutions and people in power are often perceived as, as unreachable or, or too remote. So, for example, a, a, a program like Erasmus Virtual Exchange Debate and Intercultural Dialogue Activities and other courses had offered those students like an integrated space to exchange ideas with peers from across the globe and to learn to co-create a narrative of peace and, pe and coexistence and to challenge also the speech of extremism provided by the mainstream media, as well as to uh, provide innovative solutions for the current ch challenges in the region. Moreover, it, it is also 
one of the greatest opportunities as well to connect uh, what what humanity students or foreign intellect students to build or to connect what they learn in campus with real life advocacy because many of them didn't know any other way but academic papers now they can turn academic papers into real campaigns into real reporting to reach the media so um that's it and uh, i hope i'm not exceeding my time and thank you so much Thank you, Zinap. Uh, thank you for uh, incorporating uh, the idea of uh, remote communities, which are sometimes far from the institutions, platforms, and especially decision makers, as you said, but still we have to uh, take them into account uh, when we are talking about the intercultural dialogue and uh, bridging the gap and more inclusive society. So thank you very much for, for this. and. Now moving uh, to our next panelist, uh, our next speaker is Mr. Viet Do Phan, uh, who delivered his contribution on uh, Vietnamese diaspora, as I hopefully could say, as uh, a successful uh, example of integration. Uh, Mr. Do Phan, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me uh, on this panel. Uh, I will be speaking as a representative of Vietnamese community in the Czech Republic. Uh, and I would like to talk about uh, Vietnamese community, how they got here, what they have done in order to be integrated into the Czech society, and what they have been doing so far for this country during the pandemic. And I will do my best to present some ideas how to develop the multicultural dialogue uh, between nations. Um, I have a few slides I would like to show you. Just give me a second. Um, so firstly, just a short introduction into the history of Vietnamese people in the Czech Republic. The first wave of uh, Vietnamese immigrants dates back to the 1950s when the first uh, bilateral treaty was uh, signed between uh, Czechoslovakia and Vietnam. And on the grounds of this treaty, uh, there were uh, hundreds of Vietnamese citizens, mostly war orphans, um, they came to Czechoslovakia. And since then, there were more and more Vietnamese citizens um, coming to uh, this country. And the purpose of uh, their temporary stay in Czechoslovakia was to raise their qualifications, to learn new skills so they can come back to Vietnam and build the country. Uh, in 1981, there were up to 35,000 Vietnamese in this country. And that's actually a time when my parents came to Czechoslovakia. Uh, my mother came as a student and uh, my father came as a, as a worker. And they actually met here and uh, fell in love. And um, however, after, after the Velvet Revolution, the cooperation between Czechoslovakia and Vietnam was abolished and most of Vietnamese people had to return to Vietnam. Uh, so did my parents. Uh, just a few thousands of Vietnamese stayed here, mostly because they married a Czech wife or a Czech husband. But my parents uh, decided to return to Vietnam uh, they got married there, and afterwards I was born into this world. Um, then in 1993, another immigration wave started because, because Czechoslovakia split up and the Czech Republic was established. Uh, at the time, a lot of Vietnamese people decided to come back to Czech Republic because they already knew the language, or at least a little bit, and uh, they already had some background over here. And uh, that's the reason why my parents decided to come back. Uh, in 1996, our family moved to Czech Republic alongside with thousands other Vietnamese. And uh, nowadays there are about 80 to 90,000 uh, Vietnamese people living in Czech Republic. And we are actually the third largest minority. Um, our parents are considered uh, to be the first generation of Vietnamese in Czech and uh, their kids, us, uh, we are considered to be a second generation. And if we want to talk, oh, sorry, I didn't show you the, the slide one, but, but it's fine, okay. So if we want to talk about the, uh, the integration of Vietnamese people in the society, uh, we really need to distinguish the first and the second generation. People in the first generation are hard working parents who, work from early morning till late night, so they really didn't have time to integrate. Most of Vietnamese from the first generation have their own businesses. 
They open grocery stores, restaurants, or beauty salons. Uh, as they work all day long, they are not used to having Czech friends, nor going out or, or enjoying the social life. However, the situation is very different with the second generation. You know, as our parents worked long hours, they usually hired a Czech nanny for us so and let us stay with them during the day when they had to work. And that's uh, and thanks to these Czech nannies, mostly old pensioners, uh, we were able to learn Czech language, um, Czech customs, eat Czech food, uh, and get to know about Czech culture. Also, as uh, the Vietnamese kids were sent to uh, regular public Czech schools, not international or private schools, uh, we were able to make a lot of Czech friends and integrate into the society very well. And most of Vietnamese born or raised here speak Czech language better than Vietnamese, or, and most of them think more like Czech people than Vietnamese people. And um, that's, that's uh, the reason why these kids are called the banana kids, uh, because they are yellow on the outside, um, but white in the inside. And uh, some people think it's a racist, but I, I think it's a very accurate nickname because I feel the same. I look Vietnamese, but I think in Czech language, and I also married a Czech wife. Uh, so as I said, uh, the second generation of Vietnamese kids could be a great example of how the integration should be done. However, we also realized that we really need to work on the integration of the first generation as well. And that's a great challenge. Um, one of, uh, so one of the activities we do in our association and educational institution is to organize social events where Vietnamese and Czech people can meet and get to know each other and experience the other culture so they can understand each other better. Um, in the last two years, we also participated in making two Czech movies about Vietnamese community. Uh, we created Vietnamese subtitles for those movies. And thanks to that, it was the first time ever we made Vietnamese people come to Czech cinemas to watch Czech movies. So it was a great success for us because uh, Vietnamese people of first generation never go to cinemas simply because they don't understand. And uh, apart from that, Czech Vet Educational Institution offers language courses for both Vietnamese and Czechs. And in 2018, we also opened the first Czech Vet library in Brno where people can read books and uh, acquire knowledge about these two cultures. And there are more and uh, more means we try to implement in order to um, help Vietnamese people to feel more engaged in social life in, here in Czech Republic. And uh, we believe that the key to success is to help Vietnamese people understand Czech culture and, and enjoy everything that this country offers to them. And one of our colleagues arranges uh, travel trips for Vietnamese people so they can visit the nicest places here in the Czech Republic. And indeed, it would be a shame for those Vietnamese who have been living here for 30 years and not yet not seeing Charles Bridge or Chesky Krumov, which are very famous uh, uh, places and uh, one of one of the great results of this integration was the uh, engagement of Vietnamese people during the pandemic this year. Uh, we all remember that the Czech Republic was suffering from the lack of masks at the beginning of this year and Vietnamese people across the country at the time started uh, sewing masks and donating them to the hospitals. They were also distributing masks for free for anyone who wasn't able to get one. Uh, the Vietnamese community also started raising money for ventilators for hospitals. And most of Vietnamese grocery stores were giving free food and beverage for police officers, doctors, medics, uh, firefighters within the project called Srce Pro IZS. Actually, the, the idea of this project came uh, from one of our colleagues. Uh, so with respect to what the Vietnamese community has done so far during the pandemic, I believe that they have really demonstrated how much they care about this country. Uh, they consider the Czech Republic to be their second home. And I hope that all of these good things would make Czech people realize that 
that Vietnamese people are a part of the society. And I wish this would make Czech people be more interested in foreign nations living here in the Czech Republic. I really want Czech people to know that most of us love this country as our own. And even if everything goes wrong here, we will not return to Vietnam, but we will be standing here and fighting by the side of our Czech friends. And so from my point of view, I, I think the pandemic, pandemic has been a great opportunity for all of us to show the solidarity and move on towards a better future and better integration. And I really hope and wish that all of these good initiatives during the pandemic will continue even after the pandemic is over. And um, I've, uh, this is a, my, uh, my last point is uh, regarding the integration, I think that the second generation of Vietnamese people is the bridge between the Czech and Vietnamese community. For this reason, I think the intercultural dialogue should be conducted in the first step between the Czech society and the second generation. And in the second step, the task of the second gener um, generation is to interpret and explain those points to the first generation. Because the second generation of uh, banana kids, uh, they understand both Czech and Vietnamese mentality and culture, and they can lead the dialogue better and avoid misunderstandings. So thanks to that, I believe that the integration of the first generation will be as successful as the integration of the second generation. I know it's vice versa that the, the uh, integration of the second generation is uh, somehow deeper than the first generation, but we hope we will uh, manage, uh, manage that, that both um, groups will be on the same level. So uh, that's, uh, that's some of my ideas and uh, thank you. And uh, I'm sending back to Nika. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, thank you for drawing the future perspectives, uh, especially on of deepening the understanding uh, among culture. It was so uh, very inspiring. Uh, and uh, I, I think that it's important also to mention and to have a debate, uh, not uh, also about the positive and successful examples uh, of how uh, different cultures could connect together and uh, help each other. So uh, that was really very inspiring initiative. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to give a floor to Mr. Muchka. Uh, Mr. Muchka, please, the floor is yours. So good afternoon to everyone. I'm also very grateful to be here and for this chance, uh, although it's going to be a quite uh, opportunity for critical review of the current global situation, but still thanks for that. I, I hope it might help us and be a uh, small contribution. I also helped myself a bit by uh, the presentation, which I'm going to use. Okay. I hope it works. So, uh, Following the abstract of our conference, I allowed myself and my imagination to, to dream a little bit about the current world and, war, world and to use a bit more global uh, perspective. Uh, and as we are sitting in a conference, which is a faith-based, uh, of, of faith-based organizations and very often humanistic orientated uh, organizations, which is also uh, mine, the atlas of today's world, uh, which I'm going to present. I think that all of us believe in something what could be called as a global interpersonal society, I call it. But uh, still, this is uh, rather something like a dream which we believe in, even as a religious people. And I can say, as a Christian personally, uh, I believe in this kind of society as a um, as uh, some kind of external sign of the mystical, mystical kingdom of God, of the Christian kingdom of God. So there are a, a lot of um, a lot of perspective which unite us uh, around the society. But uh, when we use this um, current COVID crisis and use it as a kind of a mirror, it enables us to to give a very critical review of the current situation. And I'm there to say that there is a no 
uh, global interpersonal society on a global level of today's world. There is no very mutual and respect, respectful uh, relationships uh, among people because it seems that the world during this crisis became even more divided into nations and nation states as it has already been before. Uh, at least since the last economic crisis in 2008, uh, this uh, new or it might be even traditional phenomenon of this division within the world increased uh, um, intensively. And uh, when we critically review the current global situation within the COVID crisis, uh, we can illustrate the situation, for example, on the issue of developing of uh, vaccine which, uh, which is not the issue of international cooperation, but it's a rather kind of commodity for a trade wars, because who is going to develop the vaccine is going to sell it uh, very well. So the world is divided and it seems like even the, the, a lot of people in the Western or global Northern countries, and this is my perspective from the Central Europe as well, seems to be quite comfortable in these conditions of their nation states. Mostly we perceive the rest of the world through the, our national perspective. And this is something what we feel comfortable in. And it seems that during the COVID crisis, the main interest and care of uh, various Western nation states and nations, it's rather like uh, take care of their own survival rather than to be able to see also uh, the others. There is a kind of integration of nations even in the Western world, let's, let's name the integration of European nations or American nations, but still when you look at it from the global uh, perspective, it seems that when you look at the external Schengen border of the European Union, for example, it seems like the European Union became even more closed towards the rest of the world. And when you look at it from the lens of the third world, so-called third world nations, it became a fortress to receive a visa, for example, today and to get inside the society. It's impossible almost. I don't expect in this current situation a lot from, from the current politicians or even traditional institutions, which seem to me or to our organizations as a quite comfortable with, with the current situation sometimes they can even profit from this division. But what I hope, and I see the chance, it's still in a civil society um, uh, at all, or in a very wide uh, society, because uh, as the whole globalization is increasing, there's also increasing responsibility for each human being to understand the rest of the world, to understand the situation of the other people. And I still think and hope that there is a chance to work with the wide general public, to, to work with people also on a local level, as you have already mentioned during your uh, speeches. Uh, and this is also the, the field uh, in which our project would like to help a little bit or to, to contribute in terms to make a people like ordinary people more capable to be more involved in current global politics uh, because they are able to understand it uh, deeply. They are understand to they are able to uh, to decide to make decisions, uh, etc. Uh, so our project uh, grew up during the so-called European migrant crisis. This wasn't very planned initiative. It was a reaction of the Ch Czech students who used to help as a uh, humanitarian uh, aid workers in Balkans during the time, during the crisis, and helping refugees and providing them with the food and clothes, etc. But when we came back to, to the Czech Republic, we faced the, the level or the quality of the public debate in our country, and we simply tried to improve it a little bit, um, try to analyze what might be even the, the media or informational causes of this uh, very low quality of the debate. And uh, uh, we simply analyzed that uh, there is a very lack of uh, the deeper understanding and deeper coverage of the, the broader context of the situation of a specific region. In this case, this was a Middle East or a Syrian, Syrian story. 
uh, from the news media coverage because they mostly are concentrated on, on only news, on a very actual events, but not providing the whole broader um, image or picture of the country and not providing the, the deeper description of the situation, how people are really living in Syria, for example. They are very often concentrated on personal stories, but not very actively providing the, the wider understanding, as I said, and reflection. Uh, so we tried to develop the project, which was called the Encyclopedia of Migration. This was a very small national project on a Czech level when we tried to um, try to develop the online encyclopedia. And this was the idea to, to create it as a platform for scholars relevant in these uh, specific issues of Middle East, of the global migration, etc. To put it in official UN data and simply to help people uh, understand more deeply what's standing behind the personal stories of Syrian migrants, for example. Uh, but then lately, and this is the ever current phase, we are trying to work on this project called the Atlas of Today's Work. We try to analyze more globally the situation. And this is something what I'd like to also reflect and uh, give it to you, that uh, even in the global uh, level of today's media uh, system, there is an infinite space of information in the internet, but uh, there is a lack of understanding. Again, there is a lack of uh, projects which would help you to give you more explanatory uh, information, which would enable you to, to understand it deeply and systematically. There is a whole industry of news, uh, but mostly this phenomenon of isolationism and nationalism, as I, as I mentioned it at the beginning, um, is increasing even within the media system. When you look at it again on a global level, critically, you can see that there is a huge dependency of the news media on their audiences. We can see it even within the American uh, news media, for example, even the New York Times, which, which uh, declared to be a global media, which means uh, like sharing the perspective of each human being all around the world. But in practice, as the 90% of their uh, subscribers are American, they, they must follow the American perspective and it means also to choose the topics and events which they are going to cover through the lens of their audience, their national audience. So even the current uh, news media system works in this terms of sharing the national perspective of the other world rather than, than sharing uh, some universalist and multi-perspective uh, point of view. There are projects uh, which we uh, like Wikipedia, which uh, is a kind of the great inspiration for us uh, because we really like this project as a as a attempt to to make people capable also in a terms to to understand the current knowledge about whatever the, the Wikipedia is absolutely open encyclopedia of of everything, but with this idea to share the knowledge to everyone, not. Uh, leave it closed in, in academia, for example. And this is something what we draw inspiration from as with our atlas, only with the idea to, to be more concentrated on the reflection of today's political and social situation in the world, to systematically review it uh, from, from the scholars and their point of view. Uh, there are the great new Phenomenons of famous YouTubers. I could, I'd like to mention this uh, uh, Yuri Dutch from Russia, uh, which started even to to cover a very unpopular topics like uh, concent like Soviet concentration camps in Russia. And today, it's following by this story was uh, has been seen by about 20 million uh, people. So there are some positive new phenomenons even among YouTubers and bloggers. But still, if even the authoritative, uh, even the religious person like, persons like this uh, Pope Francis want to draw attention to something, we need to help people to understand more deeply and systematically what's, what's happening in this specific region. So this was our attempt, which we are working on to develop this uh, kind of 
project. This is only a simulation when, when we um, when we are inspired by the Google Maps and would like to develop the kind of political or social Google Maps, which would be created fully by, by scholars. But when I come back to, to the beginning and not to talk only about our project, when I see the chance to involve into the current po global politics, the ordinary people like all of us, um, I see some a new positive uh, impacts or new positive results of this COVID crisis also. Uh, for example, many experts from the private sector, and many marketing experts saying that uh, this crisis really show us the abilities of digitalization. So I hope, and you could see even during the project presentation, that the new technologies could help us in a terms to enable people to see there is also the new phenomenon on the on the right and on top, which is called the corporate social responsibility. And it's a new tendency within uh, the corporations and even very young uh, startup entrepreneurs, uh, when they started to talk much more about their social responsibility, that they simply started to realize that they, they are doing a business within the society and they are responsible for it. So I still hope that this um, part of society might help us in our initiative. And at the very end, uh, to not be a very pessimistic, uh, look at these grassroots initiatives, like was this uh, movement started by Greta Thunberg, which was very fascinated by, by the fact that it, was, uh, it has been started by a very gentle young lady, invisible somewhere in Sweden, but simply initiated global movement. So I'd like to say that the current situation of COVID-19 even increased the nationalism and isolationism all around the world, but simply show us some, and even as a mirror, some, some chances and some new opportunities to, to struggle with this current situation on a global level. Thank you very much. I want to thank you uh, for ref reflecting on the actual role of uh, the mass media and society as I perceive, uh, thanks to our discussion, uh, as a crucial aspect of dialogue and understanding, uh, which goes through all society. I also thank you for mentioning the positive consequences of, of uh, the COVID pandemic. I think that uh, I could say that we all keep our fingers uh, crossed with your project. And uh, now I would like to open the floor for uh, the questions from uh, the audience. I see that we have uh, one uh, in the chat. Uh, I think that the, this one could be answered by all of our panelists. Uh, the question is, what can be done in uh, improving uh, knowledge among ordinary people to solve uh, the crisis or religious or scholar elites uh, in postmodern uh, post-truth era. Uh, if uh, I may ask, uh, if I may ask um, Dr. Arianto, could you please uh, start and elaborate on this uh, question? All right, uh, Nicola, thank you very much. You know, having this question uh, is actually at my personal level is very interesting. But um, when I have to speak on behalf of the OIC, then I have to be honest um, in giving the answer. Uh, as you can, uh, as you can see, or you might be aware already that the OIC is. Uh, the second largest international organization after the United Nations. And uh, more or less both of the organizations are similar in terms term of function. But uh, if I may say, if you compare head to head, the United Nations and the OIC uh, is completely different. Uh, in terms of uh, its relationship with civil societies, uh, non-government organizations and especially ordinary people because as the international organization we are i may say we are an organization who deals mostly with governments 
and uh, we have been struggling actually we have been working a lot to 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 give uh, to be given access or the possibility to have access to work together with uh, communities and uh, civil society organizations and uh, also with the, of course with ordinary people uh, if you see for instance if i come back to the my 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 first uh, information about the united nations if you go to new york uh, un headquarters you will see in around the, the UN headquarters, there are plenty of offices of NGOs, non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations just surrounding the UN headquarters, which is a kind of luxury for the OIC because so far, uh, as far as I understand, the OIC uh, cannot really work together with non-government while actually our problems uh, contemporary problems are very much related with, with the issues on the ground who um, are dealt uh, mostly by civil society organization, non-government and especially ordinary people. So if I may take an instance, uh, as someone who is dealing with the issue of Islamophobia since 2014, we have plenty, uh, so much problems when we have to deal the issue of Islamophobia when it happens in countries, non-member countries of the OIC. Uh, and as you see, most of Islamophobia issue happens in non-OIC member countries, whether it is in the US, in Europe, in France, in UK, London, and everywhere, most of them are not uh, OIC member countries. Then our difficulties are double, so that uh, most of the time, what we can do is we try to deal with the governments of that countries. So, our hand, our reach out is very limited. So if, I, if the, there is a question to posed to me uh, as the representative of uh, the OIC here in this meeting, what can be done by the ordinary people, then I have difficulties to answer. <laughs> because uh, I, I believe uh, you are the, the one who can tell us more and uh, just, a little bit information, uh, by the way. Since uh, last few years, um, maybe three or four years ago, actually we started to work together with uh, civil society organization and non organizations but most of them are still limited in humanitarian areas. I believe so far we can still work only with uh, 12 uh, organizations, non-governmental. And, and uh, we are really expecting that we can do more uh, especially in the areas which is related to youth, women, because all those things are, are I mean, so those issues are currently very, uh, very, I mean, it's kind of a trend and a global trend around the world. And as an international organization, we, we are supposed to be able to do, uh, I mean, to, 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 cap to be capable to adapt with the, the, uh, the trend and the, the, the global demand. So, that's what all I can say, Nicola. And uh, I hope our other, other panelists can have more in, in answering this question. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to move for, to the next panelist. Please, uh, Zinap, if uh, you could elaborate on this. Well, actually, about youth inclusion, and I've, uh, as I've mentioned, like, educating them about the current affairs and current uh, events going on around us through leadership programs because these programs train young people on, on, on how to debate, how to dialogue on a professional basis. And based on that, when they build, for example, arguments in their dialogues, they start in simulation to, to learn how to, to to be debaters, young debaters, not real debaters. So they learn how to research, how to, to check the facts, how also to, to write their arguments in a way to be uh, suitable for addressing uh, media, uh, media platforms or decision makers. And when they became, uh, when they become professional debaters after that, they start uh, to hold debates uh, around topics of the current um, 
for example, uh, concerns around in, in, in our communities and in the presence of, of decision makers. And here in Egypt, for Young Mediterranean Voices, has been operating this year the final uh, debating forum because it operates like debate trainer trainings for three months uh, of the year. And then uh, the final event would be like a national debate forum ended with uh, an, an, a dialogue, an open dialogue with decision makers. Uh, it is supposed to be taking place uh, next Saturday. And it will be like an open debate, both in Arabic and English, in the presence of uh, people from, uh, from environmental institutions in Egypt. Debates will be on climate action. Well, young people will uh, provide uh, real uh, arguments based on real facts and real statistics all around. So here you teach these young people how to read around current events, how to be educated, how to choose what is what is uh, seems to be um, false news to leave it or what it seems to be a right news. So they they all the time go through sources and learn how to take the credit, the the, the credible ones and leave the less credible ones. So these leadership programs enhance young people's participation enhance also their knowledge not only about their local concerns but actually since it, it is a they are mediterranean prog programs uh, it teaches or educates young people to, to learn about neighboring policies across the mediterranean not only like in the MENA region or south mediterranean or countries for example but also other shores of the mediterranean for crises like what has been happening, the tension that has been happening in France, for example, nowadays, must come to light in our debates or, or such terrorist attacks that happened in Egypt like two years ago, that we, 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 we have discussed things like that and, and highlighted all of these things. But uh, aiming by the end not to, 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 to bring, to, to, to let young people only think of actions, only re to be restricted to protests, but actually to show them other channels of taking actions like advocacy in, in dialogue or, or holding or coming to the table with decision makers and people in, 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 uh, in, the, in the, the policy, uh, in, 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 in responsible for policy actions. So all of these are our methods to bring in uh, young people or, or to, to educate or also ordinary people, not, not necessary to be those of specification or academics, to speak about what has been going on around us. And for, as I mentioned, a program like Erasmus Virtual Exchange, it's, it's another program that made it easier. It is not necessarily like you travel a, a, anywhere to, to, ha to, to participate in that, but is, uh, it only restricted is just that you can um, communicate virtually with with people from across the globe, people from across the Mediterranean specifically. And it, it has showed like a uh, very phenomenal results in, in two years of the pilot project between 2018, 2019. And there are many, like I can share you share with you three statistics if you want, like 74% of, for example, of participants um, showed an increase in digital contents after participating in, in one of the activities uh, of Erasmus virtual exchange, whether debates or dialogue. We have, for example, 91% of participants described what they learned about people from other cultures as positive or very positive, of which 31% reported a clear change from their previously held beliefs. So we have here also uh, um, giving a floor to to people to amplify their voices and not to be spoken on their behalf we have a first-hand narrative so we are closing the the, the space on anyone to produce stereotypes for example on, on some certain groups we have also 85 percent reported an increase in the ability to a culturally diverse setting to to work um, sorry in a culturally diverse setting so all of these programs not only like participate in, uh, sorry, enhanced youth participation, but also like it, it increases the skills needed and develops their, 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 their ability to have a real cause and to be effective, as mentioned before, to be real active citizens in society. Young people are part, must be part of the, that decision makers. They are gonna be the leaders of tomorrow, or like after 10 years, for example. And they have the potentials, but all what they need is that someone to give them the, the floor, the suitable floor, 
and the, the, to embrace their, their ideas and to, to hear their voices. And here we have, even if it's like on, on a smaller scale, but actually if we invest more, this, this will be something greater in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. Thank you for uh, to providing with us uh, with data. Um, if uh, Viet would like to also elaborate on the on this uh, question, uh, it's probably a bit uh, slightly different from your topic. But uh, if you would like to add uh, a comment on this, uh, the floor is yours. Well, just uh, shortly, I uh, I might be naive, but I personally believe that a lot of um, crisis and a lot of disputes can be solved by better communication and uh, because sometimes disputes occur where the knowledge is missing and especially in the Czech Republic where uh, pe people are in, in the Czech Republic people are afraid of new of something different and if people if people don't understand manners and manners which are different they tend to label them as bad and they tend to repress them. And so I believe that if they understand the reason why other people are different and why they behave, behave differently, then I think they can be more tolerant. So that's uh, one of the reasons why our organizations, we want to uh, bring nations together and we want them to learn from each other so they can understand each other better and live together in, in harmony. And uh, as I said, it, it might be naive from my point of view, but um, that's what we are trying to do here in the Czech Republic between the Czechs and Vietnamese. And I hope that it is going well. So that's, that's uh, just a short uh, answer from my point of view. Thank you. And uh, Jakub, if you have uh, something to add, please. Well, I think I've already said a lot about specifically this issue within my presentation, but what still I'd like to um, stress a little bit, it's my fascination that there's a whole social phenomenon of called the social responsibility, which has already been developed within the private sector, why it came from the private sector and still didn't enter enough into the academia, for example, or into the re religious or or state elites, uh, this is a fascinating for me. And in my eyes, this is the crucial, um, one of the crucial missions ahead of us as a scholars or religious elites and social organizations, simply to be willing to include the general public and lay people into the discussion with terms by Jürgen Habermas. This is what I like, this is a public sphere, which means that there is a one common mutual discussion where everyone is included. And when it's led on the rational uh, discussion using effects and the knowledge, but everyone is excluded and we are willing to lead this dialogue. And this is something what I still lack, uh, for example, um, within universities, there is a new uh, trend and a strategy called like the third role of universities, which might be uh, uh, comparable and connected with this uh, social responsibility, but still universities mostly do not know what to do uh, with the, the general public, how to share with them the knowledge, and mostly resign to do that because uh, this discussion might be hard and difficult. So in my eyes, this is the crucial simply to not give up this uh, mission of social responsibility of elites. Thank you, thank you to uh, Jakub. Uh, as so uh, we are uh, slowly running out of time, uh, I just want you to ask if you have uh, some closing remarks. Uh, the time is now, so please uh, don't hesitate to take the word. I think Madam Gukiu had a question, not? She raised her hand. 
No, I don't see yeah. it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, Madame Gigou with us right now. Uh, something probably happened with the connection. But if uh, if uh, no one have uh, something to conclude, I um, unfortunately have to conclude this panel by uh, myself. Uh, I would like to thank you all. Uh, it was a great pleasure. I really uh, did enjoy all the contributions and I hope that uh, we at least shed light on the main questions uh, from the panel as uh, we have an opportunity to listen to many perspectives and uh, I wish, uh, I wish, I really wish uh, we will soon meet again in a fruitful debate and hopefully in person and uh, special thanks goes uh, for sure to the audience. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, until the end. Uh, I would like to at that uh, right after this panel, there will be a closing remarks uh, of the whole conference. So uh, don't miss it. And uh, lastly, I would like to thank you uh, to all from the organizational team, especially to the conference service department. It would be hardly possible to have such an event without them. So thank you all and uh, stay safe. <laughs>